This is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're in our Fountainhead Studios here on Westwood in Port Coquitlam. And of course, we are continuing our municipal update and giving you a sense of what candidates, either incumbent or those that are running for office, uh, are thinking about and what you should be concerned about for this election. Today's uh, guest is Ben. Ben Hunt, welcome, welcome to the show. Hi, Patrick. Thank you for the opportunity. Welcome. And uh, so, as a, obviously, you've put your name in the hat to, to run for politics. So, uh, could you give the folks out there who don't know much about you uh, what you stand for and kind of why you're running? Okay. Uh, well, I, uh, brief, by way of a brief background, uh, I live in Millardville with uh, my wife and uh, two kids. They're 12 and 14. I've actually uh, owned two homes in Coquitlam, the first in the Oakdale neighborhood, which is part of Berquitlam and uh, now in Millardville. Um, I've always been deeply involved in the communities where I raise my children, and hopefully we can get into a little bit of that as we, as we go on here. Um, I'm a financial planner by profession. I've been doing that for over 20 years. And uh, yeah, my goal is to bring some financial uh, discipline to City Hall, so. Yeah, so, so when you look at uh, the, city, the city of Coquitlam, which is, uh, that's where you're running, like, yeah. what, are you, what are you seeing that you can bring to the, the council that would be of benefit to the citizens of Coquitlam? Yeah, sure. So um, as I mentioned, I've always been deeply involved in the communities where I raise my kids. Uh, first in Berquitlam with the Oakdale Neighborhood Association and now in Millardville with the Millardville Residents Association where we represent about 6,000 homes in the region. And uh, so I've had hundreds of interactions with City Hall over the years. I've got a good understanding of, of the processes there. And I'll make the following observation is that when it comes to a lot of the big issues that are presented to, to, to City Council, uh, it, it f seems as though the, the decisions are made at that level before the public gets an opportunity to weigh in. And so uh, my goal is to try to bring communities back into that conversation at City Hall. Um, um, we've seen tens of thousands of new housing units, for instance, approved at, through uh, City Council with very little debate uh, behind them. And, um, and it, it's a different situation for Patrick to go to City Hall alone and, and try to steer the agenda than it is for somebody like myself with the Millardville Residents Association, who represents 6,000 homes. Um, and we've, I've had a lot of success representing community groups. So that's, that's one of the big drivers uh, of my campaign is to bring communities back into the conversation. And I'm going to do that by reactivating, engaging, and supporting community groups out there. Did you know there's 12 uh, individual community associations in Coquitlam? No, not didn't wasn't aware of them. So. Yeah, there's 12 groups there at various stages of uh, of operation, and some of them are sort of single single issue focused groups. But my goal is to get them all activated because I think in that way we can really bring communities back to, to steering the agenda at City Hall. But I guess so, you know you talk about finance, and, and of course one of the things you uh, for the city of Coquitlam, you know it, it has a lot of land that it sort of has continually sort of sold or moved on. So is that something that you would see differently for yourself? Like, are, are you looking at how the city manages its finances? Is it just around housing or is it around everything in general? No, I think I can bring a lot of value by bringing my skill set to bear. Again, I've been a financial advisor for uh, over 20 years now. And, um, you know, my, uh, what I've witnessed at, 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 at City Hall from a financial point of view is that there's a bit of a disconnection with the financial operations at City Hall and the residents that finance their operation at City Hall. And I mean, nowhere was this more visible than during the COVID pandemic, during those years between 2020 and 2021, when, you know, residents of Coquitlam, families in Coquitlam were struggling to make ends meet. Uh, City Hall was hiring across most departments and actually even creating some new departments. Um, so I, uh, I think that our City Hall should really plan the way that the families that I represent plan during, in my profession. That means when they're looking at the budget for the year and they're looking at cash flow shortfalls or deficits, they make adjustments to that plan. They don't just lean on the taxpayer to cover those deficits every year. And so that's the kind of financial uh, discipline I, I, I think that, that I can bring to City Hall. So one of the things uh, I know most people are challenged with is the, the concept of, for, of affordable housing. I mean, Coquitlam just got acknowledged for having you know, a good reserve of rental units in place. But mm -hmm. um, can you give your sense of what affordable versus market value uh, rental housing means to you? 
Yeah, well, first of all, when it comes to housing, I think it's important to understand that uh, our municipal uh, government has a tremendous impact. After all, if a developer wants to redevelop uh, uh, and put a high rise in a single family residential uh, district. They don't go to the feds and they don't go to the province. They come to the city. So the city has a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of um, capacity to, to, to shape the future and influence over, over the housing that gets developed. When you're talking about rental housing, it's, it's, I think it's important to know that, you know, when there's rental mandates put upon developers, um, yes, it provides rental uh, more rental in the community, but it also adds to the end unit price for the market housing that is part of that development. So my kids are 12 and 14. I want them to be able to buy in this city, but uh, I'm fully aware that, you know, any sort of uh, obliga obligation that developers have to provide rental will put the end price of those market units further and further out of reach for my kids. Um, so I also look at rental in the form of, uh, of my profession. You know, I use my, my skills, I bring my skills to bear when I analyze these things. And what we, I, I kind of look at it the same, same way as I would working with a client, where we advise our clients not to uh, use over 30% of their income for housing. And so if we look at an average two-bedroom home uh, rental in Coquitlam, roughly $1,800, so that implies, using that 30% rule, that uh, the person would have to make $6,000 a month as a family or $72,000 a year. And... Um, so that's, you know, in the ballpark for what families earn today. Where you get into difficulty is with our seniors in our community, right? Because, you know, CPP and OAS combined, those are the, 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 the benefits that some seniors are exclusively dependent on to live. You combine those together, you get $24,000 a year. Using my 30% rule as an affordable housing for $24,000 a year, you need to pay about $600 a month uh, in rent. So as you can see, I mean, that's, that's well, you, I mean, I defy you to find a, a, a unit, a housing unit in Coquitlam for $600 in a rent. So that puts things way out of reach for, uh, for seniors. And so, um, so then the third thing I'd like to, to address is affordable rental, or sorry, the low market rental, okay? So I think about this new development in my neighborhood uh, on Brunette by a company called Catalyst. They're offering six floors. I forget how many units of... Uh, below market rental. <clears throat> and I think it's important to understand when it comes to below market rental, what we're really talking about is subsidized rental. Because in order to develop this uh, structure on Brunette, they really have to tap into the city's affordable housing fund. That's a taxpayer uh, funded uh, uh, um, pool, of, pool of capital that has to be tapped into. So it's very important to understand that, that below market rental is subsidized rental. Now, I don't think people including myself, will mind paying a little extra uh, in tax in order to take care of our, the most vul vulnerable in our, our society. But I just think it's important that the city makes, makes, uh, makes it clear that um, afford below market rental raises the cost of living for the rest of us because it, it means uh, it, it, it's, we're paying for it as residents, right? So, so, so I mean, a for, I mean a lot of, there's no silver bullet, I know, for affordability, but just, you know, again, you're... So f when you talk about rents like 75,000 is the average you know income level for a household in Coquitlam but that's probably skewed because you've got people who are in a sense asset rich you know they have an asset a house that's maybe 1.5 or or higher and their income could be lower so so it just that just to help kind of circle it, that argument is like we either have people living in our city who can never afford to rent or live here, and we just end up with, like, I think North Van or West Van's having the same problem. They're almost saying it's, it's not even a viable community. Mm -hmm. And Coquitlam is on the frontier of that, because mm -hmm. we're kind of right in the middle. All those folks who are moving out of that region are moving to here, mm -hmm. and there's a huge turnover, I believe, in Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam and Port Moody. So our community, I think, is changing. I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Uh, we're not all equal as in our income, but I'm just curious when it comes to affordability, we have so many different ideas, right? So, so what would be the concrete things you could bring uh, when, el when elected or if elected in Coquitlam? Sure. So um, the province and the federal government 
have developed a, a housing fund where they will spend close to a billion dollars over the next 10 years to provide social housing within our cities. Of course, it's up to the various municipalities to, to apply for those funds. Uh, but I think the answer to, uh, part of the answer to, to the housing shortages is, is to provide housing choices. Everything from carriage homes to co-op to rental, of course. Also shared housing is, uh, is a concept that I think we should be looking at especially for our seniors, because, I mean, it's economical, it's good for the environment, and it really prevents uh, seniors from, feeling, from that feeling of alienation and, and, and um, exclusion from the communities around them. So shared housing is something that I would look at as well, too. Okay, and I, I, I know it's a, a tough topic, so <clears throat> it's not easy just to solve it in one go, but, <laughs> right. but I know that uh, if you talk to different counselors, you get different opinions, sure. so uh, for sure. So uh, one of the big things uh, that we're hearing, obviously, in this region is the kind of concept of, of campaign financing. I mean, right. the city of Coquitlam just did uh, an open forum about you know, running for council, which you are. Right. And I think uh, Councillor Craig Hodge said it's fifteen to $30,000 is, is the amount of money you need to have a good run at, at council. So just your sense of, of that kind of requirement to fund that. And, mm -hmm. and the next question is, you know, if I'm running for council, how do I get that uh, if I'm not, you know, independently uh, well-to-do? So just your feedback on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is a high barrier to enter entry when you consider the, the funds needed to run for, uh, for office. But I can attest to the fact that you don't need anywhere near $15,000. Uh, four years ago, I ran in the election. I got 8,500 votes. I needed 8,570. So I came 70 votes shy. I think by any measure, that's that's pretty close. Yeah. Um, I raised, I think, a total of $7,000 or something like that. So when you break it down, uh, based on how much I paid per vote, I came in the sort of uh, dollar range. Most of the candidates were in the two, two fifty, three dollar range. So, so I'd push back a little bit on that $15,000 requirement. I think that. Um, uh, on the other hand, I mean, it's not as I, I came came into the last election thinking my ideas would be enough to <laughs> float yeah. me along to victory. That's just not the case. What you understand when you've been in one of these elections is it's more about name recognition, right? And so, um, you know, more than even more more than financing. And so, if 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 candidates are coming around every four years to ask for your vote, they're going to have a challenge because they need that name in the community. And I've been working really hard to raise my profile in the community, doing the work uh, of the community. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so the other issue about uh, campaign financing is, is, I mean, there should be some, some barriers to run for political office. We want qualified people. We want professionals, people that can bring their skills to bear when they do uh, end up on council. Um, and as I've demonstrated, you don't have to be rich to be able to, to garner enough votes to almost get in there. Uh, and so, um, so I do think that there should be, you know, it shouldn't be op wide open, but, uh, but I, also, I also think that it, it takes work between elections to, to be able to get your, your voice out there. I mean, and, and I encourage residents to do the same thing, right? I say don't come out every four years to ask for, or don't come out every four years to vote, right? You really have to show up every single day, and that's what I've been trying to do through the community associations that I work to, is really do the people's work uh, on a volunteer basis, ever since I moved to Coquitlam, actually, so yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that's a valid point. Like, sometimes people just run because they say what their friends say, you should run, but right. I think it is a, like they say, it's an ongoing process. So I appreciate that. Um, but just a, the, the tougher question there is just this sense that, you know, in Coquitlam, they have this mailer. They call it the mailer. Yeah. I think it's the city runs the mailer. Yeah. I think last election it was like $8,000 to right. participate. Right. The general census is, whether true or false, if you're not in the mailer, you don't win. Right. So, that, so what are, are you familiar with the with the mailer? Is is how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm familiar with the mailer. I found out last Tuesday that I needed to get fifty seven thousand brochures printed and be at the house to mail out by the following Friday. So that was a bit uh, frantic. And uh, well, I mean, I've got the bills from last year, which was twenty seven hundred dollars or so. This year, it's like five grand. So yeah. it has gone up dramatically. I mean, inflation is at seven or eight percent in these campaigns. These are, are not immune. Um, so the mailer is very important uh, to be in, and you know, at a minimum, I think that would be the entrance, uh, the entrance, the entering um, 
value? Uh, quality. Yeah, well, the entry criteria for people. I mean, if you, if I, I believe you should be able to go out there and raise five or six grand. You know, I, I think, and 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 it's not. Um, I, I was able to prove that last election that it can be done. Um, let me tell you about another mailer that's going to happen, though. So. Um, we've got the campaign mailer that goes out to 57,000 residents, and that I'll be in that mailer. I'm not sure how many candidates are participating. This will actually be 10 grand this year, the cost of that. There's another mailer that comes out uh, just before the election, and that's a, that's a mailer from our mayor, Richard Stewart. Right? It goes out to every single resident in Coquitlam, right? and it'll say something to the effect of, uh, elect me, Richard Stewart. Um, these are the eight candidates that I can work with, okay? And it's an incredibly effective operation because most of the people on that mail or on that list get elected. But the issue with it is that this is how Richard uh, creates a group of people that he can work with, right? But what you really have there are people working together. And this is how a slate is formed in Coquitlam. And, and it starts with that mailer. So, um, um, you know, I think it's important, uh, coming from the private sector, to have a management team or a leadership team that's able to get things done. But I also think that our city council, as a deliberative body, has tremendous capacity to come at these issues from all sides, to really, really analyze these issues and come up with better solutions from better solutions for, for the public that they serve. That's not what I've been witnessing on council uh, on the basis that it starts with that, with that mailer and it sort of uh, grows out from there where you get a group of people at city council, city council all nodding their heads at the same time. They're not necessarily doing the people's work, right? They're doing that. They're supporting each other. So uh, I hope to be a new voice on council. There's two uh, seats open. Two councillors have gone off to do other things. So I think that's a tremendous opportunity for new voices like me. Well, we're just down to like one or two questions. And I appreciate the the, the in-depth overview, and and uh, I think we could talk about that for for a bit yeah. longer. But um, uh, but I do agree. You, you need. Up, uh, different voices on council, so sometimes everybody nodding at the same time is not always good for for anybody. Uh, so for, for we talk about the resilient communities, you keep hearing that about the environment and sort of the floods and all that kind of stuff that's happened the last year. So just on the final point there, just throughout building a resilient city and how the environmental impact of Coquitlam and and what uh, what insights you could bring to that discussion. Yeah, well, I. I um I'm a strong supporter of, of uh, conservation. Now, I was a founding member of a group called Protect Coquillum's Urban Forests, PCUF, a year and a half ago or so. And I worked with a group of people, including a, a candidate for council, that um, our mandate was to protect uh, the, the green spaces in, in Coquitlam, but the tree canopy, canopy specifically. And I've knocked on thousands of doors so far uh, this year. The feedback I get from single family neighborhoods is that developers are coming in uh, to these established neighborhoods where the homes were built in the 60s or the 70s. They're wiping out these homes along with every single tree in sight. They're building up to the property lines for not, with nothing but structure. Uh, they're keeping the same parking that was in the original home, but they're adding seven or eight new bedrooms. Right? So I come from the private sector. I'm, I'm, I believe in smaller government. I'm not a big fan of the public sector telling private business owners what to do with their property. However, I think we really need to come to a happy medium when it comes to, uh, when it comes to preserving the, the, some of the greenery that, uh, that is in these older neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to campaign on, you know, when you can walk around these established older neighborhoods and really get a, get a sense for, for the, the natural beauty that, that remains in these neighborhoods. But if we keep, you know, uh, allowing developers to come in and wipe out every tree in sight, well, that's not going to, that's not sustainable. Um, but so let's. I'll come back to the question about the. So the, thank you very much about the trees. That's great. So so for me, I'm just trying to again. I understand your business background, and and we've talked about affordability. And then we've got this this OCP, and you've got green space, and you've got to build up or out. Mm -hmm. And Coquitlam has done. You know, mm -hmm. Ballardville is building up, mm -hmm. potentially. Burke Mountain is building across. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has like these two strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so in one sense, they're, they're conflicting in my opinion. Right. So what is your, what is your thoughts on, on that observation? Well, I mean, when it comes to development, I take a very simple view. I am all in favor of development that leaves the area in better condition than it was found. And that sounds simplistic, but I think about my old neighborhood in Burquitlam where um, you had a Boza development, two high rises. 
uh, around Skytrain, around the Skytrain station, and you know they've modernized the area and paid for the infrastructure around the two high high rises. But the other half of the property still looks like the 50s, right? Because it's an old Morgard property. So you know that's a that's a that's an example of of development leaving the area in better condition than it was found. Uh, I am for development around. Skytrain stations around transit hubs. Um, I, uh, I, am, I am against development in our single family residential uh, communities. So, so in your world, you'd want to have dense areas and areas that are single family? Absolutely. And yeah. I think it's, when single family would be a home or detached or, or townhouses or just to clarify. Well, there's many forms of, of, uh, of family homes. I think the, the word family is operative there because we do want families coming into Coquitlam. We want to create a welcoming environment for families to, to be here. Uh, but single family homes, I think about my neighborhood. So I live uh, in Millardville. I live in a, a, a detached home with six other homes beside us. There is also townhouses around. There's also, uh, but, and there's um, some medium density as well, too. Um, so... I think development around the single family areas, it would have to be a case by case basis, but, uh, but you know, we don't want to see high rises around these single family areas. I think you know, a combination of housing choices, whether it's homes like mine or, or townhouses or you know, suites or carriage homes, that type of thing, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's. Yeah. Well, I guess it just, I mean, come back to the, on the housing side, it's like uh, everybody's different. But I know from my sense, you know, uh, from, from living here long enough, financially, my house is worth a lot of money, you know, on, in the walls. Yeah. But I know that for my, for my kids, that's, that's uh, and, and their kids, it's a challenge. So a lot of people look at us as the sort of the, the lucky ones, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I'm just trying to, the sense of the city, because you look at the city, it looks vibrant and it's growing. But at the same time, it feels like something's not right, like because people can't really live here and mm -hmm. people are leaving. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like gentrification, but mm -hmm. at a different income level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just as a business person mm -hmm. and, and a free mm -hmm. enterprise, help me square that argument because yeah. I, I'm really kind of um, I'm kind of torn with with the two principles. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, on one hand, you have, have to let market forces do their work. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you need to provide housing for, for all. And one of the things that doesn't get brought up enough is how much extra cost the city's initiatives put on the end price of homes. There was recently some research by Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation that, uh, uh, that um, suggested that city costs, so we're talking density bonusing, development cost charges, um, parking in lieu, there's, there's several revenue streams to the city from new development. But as it turns out, those costs are landing on the end price, or, or land on the, at the end price of, of the housing unit uh, to the tune of about 25%. So the research showed that the city's cost was putting about 25% additionally onto the end price of, of the housing unit. So again, you know, my kids are 12 and 14. I, uh, I want them to be able to buy a home here, but those municipal costs are, are putting the housing market further and further out of reach. Now, the city will, give you, will, will suggest that, well, listen, we can put those, they'll create a, 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 a choice where we, they can put those costs on the developer or they can put the costs on residents. And the residents uh, like that strategy because they see that their, their taxes will be reduced at the expense of the developer. But you know, those, those benefits are illusory, right? Because the fact is it just adds to the end price of the housing and creates a housing market that's more out of reach for all of us. And so for me, the, the last point would be, you know, when I check my income, you know, my, my property tax, my, my house value, I mean, my land, the land is the most expensive part of my, of my property. The actual physical building is, is very uh, 20, 25% of that cost. So it's kind of that concept of this land bank, you know, having municipal land that in a sense has high value, mm -hmm. but it also, it, it's a, it can nurture the community as sort of reducing that cost. Like, uh, does, do you see that as a strategy? 
I'm not sure. I, uh, well, like in Port Coquitlam, we just basically gave up four acres of land for a developer to build, yeah. you know, 450 yeah. units yeah. market yeah. value. Yeah. So, so the, the city itself has assets in land. Yeah, yeah, they do. And a lot of development of social housing is around somebody gives the land to somebody mm -hmm. who then turns around and makes that, that property. Mm -hmm. So how does that change the economic model? Do you, do you sort of support that? or? <clears throat> Well, I, I, I've learned a little bit about the mechanism behind the, the land reserve at City Hall. Um, and generally how it works is uh, the, the common knowledge out there is that cities can't go into debt. But in fact, cities can go into debt. And what they do is they borrow against that land reserve uh, to finance infrastructure around new development. Okay? So... Um, so when they, when you know, City Hall approves a new land development, they need to put in the pipes and the streets and the lights and the sidewalks. Well, they're borrowing against that reserve, and they're and they're pay, paying it back with uh, with developer funds in the future. So uh, I mean, that's a little insight behind the mechanism behind um, the, the the our, our land reserve, um, and uh, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, it's not a. I, I'm not asking you for the silver bullet. I just, I know, yeah. it's, I know it's a tough conversation, but yeah. uh, maybe if we have more open uh, discussions in politics, maybe we'll find that answer. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you want to add? I mean, we've talked about you know, housing crisis, environment, trees. Yeah. Is there anything else? I mean, obviously you ran last and you came very close, mm -hmm. and you spent four years working towards this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what what things? Like, it's kind of like a do over, I guess, or that you, you've engaged with the public. You know, so, so what, what, what is your final few points you want to pass along to those folks out there who may not have voted for you last time? Right, right. Um, well, yeah, again, I did, I did come very close last election, and uh, I found, I've been thinking about this, and, and it's, it's kind of, it kind of proves uh, wrong, that theory that by doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results is a form of insanity, right? Yeah. Because... Technically, I, I'm doing the same thing this time around, but I'm getting a lot more resonance. I think on the basis that, you know, from a financial standpoint, my ideas around lowering the cost of government and bringing some financial discipline to City Hall is resonating with people because four years ago, inflation wasn't at 8%. So those ideas are really resonating with people more than, more than last time around. Um, and when it comes to, you know, bringing communities back into the conversation at City Hall. Uh, you know, our, 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 our residents really, that idea really resonates with them. I mean, people want to play a meaningful role in their local government. And when you turn a blind eye towards the operations there, that's how we're getting unanimous approval after unanimous approval at City Hall with very little uh, conversation. Now, now City Council, as a deliberative body, has tremendous ability to come at these issues from all sides. I've seen them at their best, but I'm afraid that's, uh, uh, that's not what we're seeing today. And uh, I hope to bring some new ideas at City Hall and, and bring a fresh voice to City Hall. I will bring these ideas uh, rooted in reason. They'll be well-researched, they'll be fact-based, and I will pr present them uh, in a respectful fashion. Uh, but I, I really think some new voices on council are, are needed. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming in. That's great. Uh, that's uh, Ben Craig. He's uh, running again for councillor in the city of Coquitlam. If you want to learn more about uh, Ben Craig, check out his website, obviously, and his platform. Ben, thank you very much for coming into the studio. Thank you very much. Thank great. you, Patrick. Thank you.